Hello, hello, welcome back. Welcome back to my channel, The Cheryl Hubbard Show. Glad to see you. Glad you can be here. Glad you can join me. Um, let me see if I can put my, put my, uh, put my little scarf up there a little bit better, but glad you can be here. Glad to see you. Glad you can join me. Uh, Cheryl Hubbard Show. Uh, just want to talk about a few things, uh, today. This is just going to be an, uh, informational session. So I like to start out, I have my little lalas. As you know, I always have, uh, my little lalas. And these right here are good for you. Uh, they build up your immune system. Um, has five grams of protein, um, real fruit, probiotics, made with real fruit, probiotics. Five grams of protein. Also, it has a vitamin D, ten percent uh, vitamin D, uh, fifteen percent calcium, uh, fifteen percent vitamin A, uh, ten percent protein. It does have dietary fiber, and that is fibers, and that is uh, seven percent. Uh, sodium, four percent. Uh, cholesterol, two percent. Uh, total fat. Is two percent. It has one hundred thirty calories. I'm trying to see uh, the sugar content. Uh, Called yogurt yogurt smoothie. Five five grams of protein. Uh, strawberry has to contain strawberry. I right, shake them up that way because I know a lot of times when I get to talking every time. I get ready to read or talk and my nose gets stopped up so I you know I just pour it in a little glass like this. So and uh I was trying to find the sugar content. Mm hmm Trying to find the sugar content. But I don't uh let's see. It says, for more than six decades, Lala has been proud to be a part of generations of traditions through our dedication to quality and passion for our, for our authentic Mexican flavors. I ain't know they've been around that long because I really just started drinking these. Mm hmm And also, I just recently... Also, I just purchased these for uh, me and my son, uh, kids, uh, airborne, and um, you know they are just uh, says uh, health supporting uh, your immune system mm -hmm. for kids, and they said don't take them more than two a day. So this is what they look like. They look like little. They real good, gummy, little gummy things, and they have uh, it has um five grams of sugar, thirty, thirty calories, uh, seven grams of carbohydrate, total carbohydrate seven grams, vitamin A, four percent vitamin A, uh, five hundred milligrams of vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, thirty percent vitamin E, magnesium, two percent. 6% zinc, selenium, 18%, magnesium, mag manganese, 3%, proprietary uh, herbal blend, 23.3 milligrams. It says uh, other ingredients, corn syrup, sugar, water, gelatin, natural flavors, pectin, colors from fruits and vegetables. Assorted fruit flavors, assorted fruit flavors, uh, as you see right here, vitamin C, vitamin C, and nine vitamins, minerals, and herbs, and uh, airborne. I remember uh, when I first learned about airborne, I think a teacher, uh, it said immune support supplement. 
A teacher invented airborne, and I think she sold a company. It said for ages four plus. <laughs> Vitamin C. So it's good. It's, they taste pretty good. But uh, it says uh, always consult your pediatrician. Always consult your pediatrician before giving your child dietary supplements. Do not take if pregnant, breastfeeding, on medication, or with a known medical condition unless you have consulted a physician. Keep out of reach of children. Protect it with a tamper evidence seal. Do not use if the seal is broken. Uh, store in a cool, dry place. So do not take if uh, pregnant, breastfeeding, or, or on medication. <laughs> so, you know, they are good to try, but you do have to watch out. So let me get started on what I want to read up on today. So welcome back to my channel. Comment below. Subscribe below. And uh, comment below. Subscribe below. Um, you know, give me some thoughts on what you may want me to talk about. And um, I'll gladly be able to, you know, I'll gladly talk about, you know, I don't mind doing research because if it's, if it's a new term or something new, if, if it's relating to, you know, as long as it's, as long as it's ethical, if it's related to business, law, accounting, anything in the business field, or anything pertaining to, um, you know, making, making products, making, you know, starting the product line, you know, these are, these are my books that I had. I designed them, but I had, um, um, see, Vista Prince printed them up. They just, you know, regular tablets. So I designed them. And they just regular little tablets, you know. It's just something that, uh, anybody could do, you know. You go to vistaprint.com and you can design them yourself how you want them. You don't have to have your picture on the front if you don't want to, like I did, but this is how I wanted to brand. I wanted to brand like this. And, uh, a lot of my products I do have, uh, <laughs> pictures on a lot of my products right here and uh this is uh these are my custom boxes that i use for products that i do uh make so uh these are my oils that uh mm -hmm. Just created the recipe for that, and then also I have uh, this is uh, this is uh, Kenneth Senior Boss Man Hair Growth Balm for Men. Excuse me. So I designed the label. That's my logo. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have that, and then I have uh, Clinton's, Clinton's Moisturizing Bed Balm for Men. So these are just my little sample. Sample jars. Also have some small jars like this. I have plenty of labels that I ordered. And this is my Grow Your Hair Girl formula that I created. Um, shea butter, mango butter, and uh, different ingredients. And uh, I do have So, and then, you know, my thank you cards. Everything has my logo on it. So, it made like that in the front. So, and then these right here, they open up. I like these in particular, but I might do some different designs. I might rebrand later and change everything and also make lip glosses too. And um, I don't know if I'm going to market these on my 
I don't know if I'm going to do the lip glosses. I don't know if I'm going to market them on my web page or not. But I definitely want to do the oils. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like I said, these are the boxes that I just received. And uh, so everything, and the, actually then I also have some smaller boxes. I have the smaller ones that I had purchased before. These are bigger. But these are smaller. smaller but just wanted to you know show them let me let me get on with my information for today okay get on with my information for today my little drink So like I said, oh, thought it hurts my walking. So I want to say thank you for joining me. Glad you could be here. Glad to see you. So as you know, I'm Cheryl Cheryl from Shirley Cosmetics, and you know, I'm just starting my uh, you know, just started my little brand, my little brand, uh, my little brand venture, I guess I would call it. It's I mean, the branding with my labels, my logos, but it's a little bit business venture, I would call it, I guess. But let me get started. Okay. So, first thing I want to talk about is, let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the First Amendment. First Amendment, basic freedoms. Uh, okay. First Amendment basic freedoms. What basic freedoms are guaranteed in the First Amendment? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press. Okay, so Americans often know more constitutional law than they think. The media, despite criticisms about their reporting, present, present, present so much about the law that the general public has at least a feel for some basic legal tenets. Tenets, I guess it's tenets. Uh, this is certainly the case with the First Amendment, uh, which most people, even children, know has to do with freedom of speech. A generation of Americans witnessed firsthand the influence free speech had during the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, and elections across the country. Okay, so the music on. A generation of Americans witnessed firsthand the influence free speech had during the Vietnam War. Let's see if I can turn it so it won't be so loud. See my little ring light. Mm -hmm. See my ring light with my phone. Be so loud, you know. Okay. 
It's better than reading about the uh, First Amendment. Uh, a generation of Americans witnessed firsthand the influence free speech, free speech had during the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and elections across the country. If there is a downside, it may be that there is also a generation of Americans who take such freedom for granted because of its continual existence. Being able to speak out, particularly against the government, remains a cornerstone of freedom in the United States. What free speech is, what free speech is there if not in opposition to those in power? No greater right do we have in this country than than um than that of speaking out speaking than that of than that of speaking our minds and being able to hear from others. But even this right is not obsolete. The First Amendment prohibits Congress from making any laws that restrict freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, or the right to gather or assemble peaceably and to request the government to respond to complaints from its citizens. Differences and difficulties in interpretation have characterized much of the later history of the First Amendment. For example, despite the apparent absolute prohibition in the, in the phrase, Congress shall make no law, Congress has, in fact, many times passed laws in the public interest that restrict freedom of religion, speech, and press. Keep in mind that the framers of the Constitution, uh, the framers of the Constitution, intended to construct only the basic framework of American law. Those very general terms, such as religion, speech, and press, have have proved worthy of great debate as U.S. law continues to grow and change. Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is the first right set forth in the Bill of Rights. Freedom of religion. The colonists who fled religious per persecution cherished their right to worship as they saw fit in their in their new country. Because religious religions differ differed from colony to colony with Episcopalians predominating in one area, predominating in one area, Presbyterians in another and Congregationalists and Quakers and others, and others, still the Founding Fathers wanted to guarantee every individual religious freedom. So in the Constitution of the United States of America, uh, you know, the framers of the Constitution, they wanted, they wanted to grant us our right to free speech. That's why you see a lot of protesters out there when certain things come down or come about, you know, Protesting as they are out there exercising their right to the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, religion, and freedom of the press. That means the press, that's why you see the news people, when something go down, news people right out there with their microphones. So they uh, have the right to cover those stories according to the First Amendment, to the Constitution of the United States of America. So the first... Uh, the first amendments to the Constitution are the Bill of Rights. So let's see what I have next. Let's talk about uh, <coughs> and we have the free exercise clause uh, in the uh, Constitution. See the free exercise clause. Uh, the First Amendment declares that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The First Amendment was intended to allow everyone under the jurisdiction of the United States to entertain such notions respecting his relations to his maker and the duties they impose as may be approved by his judgment and, and conscience, and to exhibit his sentiments in such form of worship as he may think proper not injury, not injury us to the rights of others. Okay, so what about interpretations of the Constitution, uh, the Constitution of the United States of America? Sometimes it is interpreted differently by different people. 
different different sections of the Constitution, interpretations. What exactly did the authors of the First Freedom First Amendment uh, Freedom of Religion Clause uh, uh, intend? Did they mean as Justice as Justice Black argued that the statement Congress shall make no law meant just that Congress and through the Fourteenth the Fourteenth Amendment the states uh, could not in any way, shape, or form do anything that might breach the wall of separation? Or did they mean that while government could not prefer one sect over another, it might provide aid to all religious um, equality? Or oh, equally, no, all religions equally. Uh, freedom of speech is the liberty to speak openly without fear of government restraint. Implicit in this is the right to hear others' ideas. Freedom of speech is closely linked to freedom of the press because this freedom includes both both the right to speak and the right to be heard. In the United States, both freedoms, commonly called freedom of expression, are protected by the First Amendment. Freedom of expression, protected by the First Amendment. Freedom of, freedom of speech, expression, includes the right to speak and the right to be heard. Freedom of speech and the constitutional limits uh, to it have been defined and practiced by Supreme Court rulings. The First Amendment right to free speech was the first guarantee to be made applicable to the states through incorporation of uh, Gitlow versus New York, 1925. Restrictions on freedom of speech. Now, I knew you know there had to be some restrictions. See, you have freedom of speech, but you can't just say anything you want because you can't threaten nobody. You can't threaten nobody just because you have freedom of speech. You can't get, you don't get to say anything because you can't, you can't defame nobody's character. You can't say nothing lie or you can't say a lie. You can't tell a lie about somebody, you know, and say it out, you know, just because you have freedom of speech. You say, a, say, for instance, what if you say, oh, that person, that person hit my car. That person has um, AIDS or that person, you know, something. Something false. You cannot say uh, anything false. So let's see what they're saying. Uh, an important understanding of the Constitution is that rights are not absolute. And this is the case with freedom of speech. In balancing personal interest and the public good, reasonable limits are placed on what can be said. When and that's what I'm saying. Reasonable limits are placed on what can be said. When and where. Restrictions on freedom of speech have occurred most often in time of war and national emergency. The Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 were the first uh, incursions by Congress on this freedom. Uh, these acts were passed when war with France threatened. They empowered the president to expel uh, dangerous aliens and provided for ind ind indicting those who should unlawfully combine or conspire against the administration or write, write or speak with intent to the defame. That's what I'm saying, see? That's what I said. Defamation of character, intent to defame. You, just because you have freedom of speech, you can't defame nobody's character. You can't have an intent to defame. You can't, and you can't threaten nobody. You can't use freedom of speech. In other words, they're saying you got to be in certain places where certain things that you say is re certain things that you say are are restricted uh so let's say that freedom of re speech restrictions so clear and present danger the court began the court began to apply this clear and present danger test to subsequent cases involving freedom of speech another test restricting freedom of speech was whether an expression tended uh to lead to bad results for the public and then we have uh Oh, we have something called the clear and probable danger test. Whether the gravity of the evil discounted by its improbability justifies such invasion of free speech as is necessary to avoid the danger. This standard has sometimes been called the clear and probable danger test. Then we have the imminent lawless action test. Uh, in, in Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1969, the court adopted a new test. The eminent lawless, the eminent lawless uh, action test. While government has a justifiable interest in preventing lawless conduct, the mere discussion of such conduct would not necessarily cause eminent lawless action. 
The court in Brandenburg said a three-part test that the government must meet if certain communication is not to be protected by the First Amendment. The speaker subjectively intended incitement in context, the words used were likely to produce imminent lawless action, and the words used by the speaker objectively encouraged and urged incitement. Sometimes what you say, in other words, they say what you say, what you say can incite violence. It can incite violence or it can incite, you know, it can have, it can incite happy, happiness in someone and then also what you say can incite violence. Uh, while government has a justifiable interest in preventing lawless conduct. See, they, they have an interest in preventing lawless conduct. <laughs> A clear and present danger test was, was replaced by the imminent lawless action test in determining when speech should not be protected by the First Amendment. Yeah, because you say the wrong thing, you're not going to be protected by the First Amendment. Like I was just saying, because if you threaten somebody or you defame somebody's character, that's not going to be protected by the First Amendment because they're going to, you know, you'll be in trouble for that. And first Amendment right. Now, if you have your First Amendment right, depending on what you say, then you'll be protected, you'll be protected by the First Amendment. Well, if you say the wrong thing, then you're going to be, you know, in, in, some, in deep trouble. Uh, okay, let me see. Let me see what I got. I already have things sectioned out, okay? All right, let's see what we, let's determine. That was the First Amendment. Freedom of speech and religion and freedom of the press. Let's move over. Uh... Let's get into it. Let's talk about the Second Amendment, the debate. Okay, uh, the debate. Interpreting the Second Amendment. Uh, in 1794, the militia was composed of all free male citizens armed with muskets, bayonets, and rifles. Now, the militia is generally considered to consist of National Guard units in every state armed with government supplied and owned sophisticated modern weaponry. Uh, how might the great differences in today's militia from that in 1794 uh, affect the interpretation of the Second Amendment? Um, the central controversy over the Second Amendment is whether people have a right to bear arms as individuals rather than only as part of a militia. So in the Second Amendment, you have a right to bear arms. You know, you, you, uh, you want to, you know, you want to register a firearm, you know, you probably have to go through a waiting period. You have to have a, go through a background check, probably extenuous, uh, extenuating, extenuous uh, background check, I guess. And so, you know, criminal, make sure you don't have no criminal record because, uh, and now not only that, mental, your mental, your mental state, your mental status, they don't want to issue a, a gun or weapon to somebody that has has a mental problem, mental illness. <laughs> okay, um, individual rights versus states rights. The two opposing interpretations of the Second Amendment involve whether the amendment guarantees the right of individuals to keep and bear arms or whether it guarantees the state state's freedom from federal government Infringement, infringement on this on this right. Uh, proponents of the right to bear arms, in, including the National Rifle Association, endorse an individual rights interpretation that would guarantee that that right to all citizens. Of course, the National Rifle Association, because they they probably stand to make some money. Off, I mean, I guess they they're not the stores, you know, selling uh, these weapons. They that's the stores uh so it says the National Rifle Association, they are the proponents of the right to bear arms. So I guess the the rifle association, uh in other words, they have they are proponents, so they they agree, I guess. They agree that people should have uh their they should be able to invoke their Second Amendment rights to bear arms, you know. 
So, uh, then we have uh, case law and the Second Amendment. Federal regulation of uh, firearms possession was virtually non-existent for more than 140 years following ratification of the Bill of Rights. Uh, let's see what, we, what else we have. Uh, they have concealed concealed carry laws. It says uh, the laws regulating carrying and concealed weapons vary from state to state. So if you want to carry uh, a firearm, you know, I know in uh, D.C., I mean, you can't carry no weapon unless you're, you know, law enforcement. But I know, I think it's, uh, is it Florida? Yeah, Florida has, uh, um, they have a carry, uh, they have a, what they call a carry, I think they can carry weapons. Yeah, like when they're in the street, they can carry weapons. But, you know, Washington, D.C., we don't have that here. Thank goodness. The laws regulating carrying and concealed weapon vary from state to state. Many states have laws stating the carrying of a concealed weapon is a basic right of citizens. I don't think that, you know what, that's why I said you got to look up the laws in different states because you don't want to move to those states where they walking down the street and they carrying weapons and you ain't used to that where you live at, you know. So, you know, I have to think about those type of things. Say many also require the completion of classroom and range training courses. Other states limit limit permits to carry a concealed weapon and a few states issue no permits. As with the gun control issue in general, much controversy surrounds concealed carry laws. So some states allow them to carry a concealed uh, concealed weapon. So I know Florida does. I heard say, a lot of times I I look at the news and uh, I look at the news and I find out things. Sometimes I look at it and my husband he used to look at the news. We used to look at the news every day. We try to find out what's going on. So Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, like I said, some states, and then I think, uh, was it, yeah, what was, it, what was that state? I think, I know Florida has a carry, uh, you can carry a concealed weapon, you can carry a weapon, you know, walking down the street, they just carry a weapon while they're walking down the street. That's what I'm saying, and when you move to a certain station, you know, one of, you want to research the laws and find out, you know. <laughs> Try to keep the little music going. <laughs> so let me see what I have next. Um um, in opposition to gun control, a uh, common argument among gun control opponents is the claim that such laws will only put guns where they do not belong. Right, you got people walking down the street being able to carry a uh, concealed weapon. You don't know people's mental state. Mental state. When you get a man, all they do is pull out their gun and then, you, you know, it'd be more, more crime on the street than, you know, they can handle then law enforcement can handle. Um, in support of gun control, one advocate of gun control is Gilbert G. Gallegos, 2000, national president of the Fraternal Order of Police, who states, we prefer to, re we prefer to refer to the issue as crime control, not gun control. Crime control. Our members, uh, the large majority of whom are ranked and file officers continue to support the Brady Law and assault weapons ban. The Fraternal Order of Police supports regulations consistent with these laws, but does not support any new firearms legislation. We hope, however, that the next administration does a better job of enforcing the firearms laws we have on the books now. Many advocates of gun control criticize the ability of some to uh, circumvent. Circumvent means to get around to get around the law. The Senate to prevent handgun violence states, despite legislation now, 
Bad in the sale of assault weapons, thousands of these firearm, firearms are presently uh, in private hands and available for sale at gun shows because of grandfather clauses in the laws. So, you know, it's just a debate, you know, it's a debate when it comes. So, in other words, they feeling that, um, um, you know, they feel that if you have your right, you know, in other words, they feel some, I guess the, uh, some of the officers were feeling that, uh, that they feel that it's needed, you know, in their opinion, it's needed. It's needed, so, so in other words, uh, it says Gilbert G. Gall Gallegos, 2000, it says, uh, it says, our members, the large majority of whom are rank and file officers, continue to support the Brady Law and assault weapons ban. So the Fraternal Order of Police supports regulations consistent with these laws, but does not support any new firearms legislation. We hope, however, that the, the next administration does a better job enforcing the firearms laws we have on the books now. So they, uh, I guess he's saying that uh, rank and file officers support the Brady Law because you remember Brady was Brady was injured. Brady was injured. I forget who he was injured by. He was injured by. He was injured by some some gentleman. I guess he was shot. I think then Reagan they had tried to um, shoot him. They tried to shoot him too. Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and then uh, Brady. Oh no. Okay, I know now. Brady. Brady was protecting Reagan. It's been so long ago, you know. You have to read up on those things again, you know. Brady was uh, protecting uh, Reagan when he got shot. So that's why they had the um, the Brady, the Brady, uh, the Brady Law and the Brady Law and assault weapons ban. So they can probably try to ban those assault weapons. Okay, so in support of gun control, right? Guns have to be controlled because things are not going to get any better if the laws don't change. And me, I am not a, I don't like guns at all, so I'm like, get them out of the hands of, you know, people that's going to do, that wants to do harm to someone else. Get them out of their hands, you know. So like they say, guns don't kill people. It's the people that's killing the people. The people, guns in the wrong hands is what's killing people. Guns in the wrong hand. Okay, now let me see. Let's talk a little bit about uh, conducting constitutional seizures. Okay, conducting constitutional seizures. So basically, they probably talk about uh, searches and seizures. We talking about searches and seizures. We talking about um, the Fourth Amendment, uh, Chapter 8 discuss how the Fourth Amendment influences searches and seizures. Uh, this chapter, so basically your privacy rights, searches and seizures, uh, they, you know, you have a right to privacy. You don't have, they don't have a right to search your private possessions unless they have probable cause or warrant. Or if less than that, then if they ask you, you know, if you say no, then hey. Chapter 8 discusses the Fourth Amendment influences searches and seizures. Uh, this chapter looks at the requirements for the ultimate seizure, a lawful arrest. Perhaps one of the most intrusive and powerful of all government actions is the actual taking into physical custody or the arresting of an individual. The police have this unique power, setting them apart from all other professions. It is also the power that the Constitution seeks to control through a variety of rules in the courts. And while an area of extreme concern for champions of the Constitution, the necessity for the power to arrest is recognized as a, as a power government requires. An arrest is, is a seizure of the person. And so the Fourth Amendment applies. While any citizen 
may arrest pursuant to their state laws pertaining to citizens' arrest. These statutes require the suspect to be turned over to police to a police officer. <laughs> then has the authority uh, to determine whether the arrest will be accepted. So in other words, you can do a citizen's arrest, but you have to turn it over, turn them. <laughs> Suspect over to the police. I never thought about a citizen's arrest doing nothing like that because you don't want nobody to attack you. You trying to arrest somebody, you don't have, you know, the proper gear on you, you know, because of the power of government has to arrest. Constitutional limitations are in place to prevent uh, abuse. This chapter begins with a discussion of stops, including stops of vehicles. This is followed by a look, a look at detention tantamount to arrest. We had an investigatory stop. We had a Terry stop. The Terry case established that the authority to stop is independent of the power to arrest. A stop is not an a stop is not an arrest, but it's a it's a seizure within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, and therefore requires reasonable reasonableness. Uh, the Fourth Amendment does not require the Fourth Amendment does not require a policeman who lacks the precise level of information necessary for probable cause to arrest to, uh, to simply shrug his shoulders and allow a crime to occur, occur or a criminal to escape. On the contrary, Terry recognized that it may be the essence of good police work to adopt an intermediate response. So let's see, then we also have uh, traffic stops. Although the operation of a motor vehicle or public road is considered a private, I mean a privilege, the driver and occupants remain protected by the Constitution. Delaware versus Prowse, 1979, established that except in those situations in which there is at least clear, articulable, reasonable suspicion that a motorist is unlicensed or that an automobile is not registered or that either the vehicle or an occupant is otherwise subject to seizure for violation of law, stopping an automobile and detaining the driver in order to check his driver's license and the registration of the automobile are unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment. So, even though we can be on the street, um, even though you can be on the street driving a vehicle, it's not against the law, but when you have your car, that's not registered. You don't have no insurance on it. And then you are in the wrong. Yeah, because it says, um, although the operation of a motor vehicle on public roads is considered a, pri a privilege. So we have a privilege to drive. But except for those situations in which there is at least clear, articulable, reasonable suspicion that a motorist is unlicensed, so you can't drive without a license, you gotta register your car, and you can't be, uh, you know, driving drunk or nothing like that. So that's what they're saying when it comes to that. So let's see what else we had. We had a pretext, uh, oh, my nose, every time I get on, every time I get to talk, my nose is itching, my nose gets stuffy. Um... We have a pretext stop stopping a vehicle supposedly for a motor vehicle infraction, but with the intent to search for evidence of a crime. That's how they do the little tricky stuff. You want to stop pretext stop. We want to stop you, uh, stopping you, stopping your vehicle for a motor vehicle infraction. In other words, you ran a light. Motor vehicle infraction. I mean, I guess that would be like you run a stop sign, you run a light, but they had the intent to search your car for uh, evidence of a crime. But let me see what they're saying. It said, courts have differed on whether an arrest has actually occurred when an offense for which the party has been stopped constitutes more than a petty uh, violation. Officers have broad discretion in how they did, how they would deal with traffic law violations. And in many instances, may cite the driver, issue a summons for a required court appearance or arrest and jail the defendant. Uh, okay. Arrest with a warrant. Arrest with a warrant where arrest may be made. 
and they had warrantless arrests or for crimes committed in the presence of an officer, a warrantless arrest for crimes committed in, a, in the presence of an officer. If police officers observe a crime being committed, they have the authority to arrest the individual involved in committing the crime. In the presence of, in the presence of, includes any other officer's senses, for example, hearing a drug by going down or smelling the odor of marijuana. So, something good to know. The information the officer obtains becomes a probable cause for arrest. Uh, as noted in State v. Plough, Plough, 1923, the officers must know that a crime is being committed before making the arrest. They cannot merely suspect that someone is about to commit a crime. The crime or the, crime or the attempt must actually take place in the officer's presence. Police may arrest for any crime committed in their presence. So, the officers come across you and they see you. Uh, smoking marijuana, like they said, or you know, some kind of crime. You, they saw you rob a liquor store, and um, they can arrest you. Say warrantless. They don't need no warrant if they see it or hear it. Yeah, that's when they can, you know. That's why it's good to read up on these type of things. Yeah, I'm just, you know, want to refresh my memory, and hopefully, I'm refreshing your memory too. Uh, so, uh. Elements of an arrest. When arrest may be lawfully made. Uh, the elements of the arrest are intending, intending to take a person into custody, exercising authority to do so, detaining or restraining a person to be arrested, and the arrestee understanding what is happening. Warrantless, or warrantless arrest based on probable cause. The second type of lawful uh, warrantless arrest is an arrest based on probable cause. <laughs> That a suspect has committed a felony, referring to the discussion of probable cause discussed previously. If a law enforcement officer has sufficient information to reasonably believe, given the totality of the circumstances, that a crime is or has occurred and that the suspect is the offender, the officer may arrest without a warrant, but, may, but only for a felony level crime. As with warrantless crimes committed in the presence of an officer, some states have statutory exceptions permitting warrantless arrest based on probable cause for certain lesser crimes such as driving while intoxicated, domestic assault, and shoplifting. You gotta read the laws of your state. It's just what I'm saying. See, um, as with warrantless crimes committed in the presence of an officer, some states have statutory exceptions permitting warrantless uh, arrest based on probable cause for certain lesser crimes. So you would definitely have to know the laws of your state. So they have a statutory exceptions permitting warrantless arrest based on probable cause. Arrest or arrest with a warrant. A conventional interpretation of the Fourth Amendment requires that to be reasonable all arrests be made with to be reasonable, all arrests be made with a warrant based on probable cause. The warrant must name the person making the complaint, the specific events being charged, the name of the accused, and the basis for the probable cause. <laughs> the person making the complaint must swear the, must swear the facts given are true and sign the complaint. Usually, the complaint is made by an investigating police officer uh, in the United States versus Washington, 1976, the court held. Law enforcement officers may find it wise to seek arrest warrants where practicable to do so, and their judgments about probable cause may be more readily accepted where backed by a warrant issued by a magistrate. The court went on to note, however, we decline to transform this judicial preference into a constitutional rule when the judgment of the nation and Congress has for so long been to, uh, been to authorize warrantless public arrest on probable cause. So oh, man, this law stuff is something else. Uh huh. So we also then we had the uh, knock and announce room. The knock and announce room. Uh, officers can break a door, a window, or break a car window. 
Break a door or window or break a car or car window to make an arrest if necessary. So they can break your door, break your car, break your car window, break your door or window or break a car window to make an arrest if necessary. But the general rule is that law enforcement officers must first knock and announce, knock and announce the authority and purpose before breaking into a dwelling. Uh, this is referred to as a knock and announce rule. So they have a knock and announce rule. Uh, the knock and announce rule not only protects citizens' rights, it can also enhance officer safety in executing the warrant. For example, a plain clothed police sergeant was killed while executing a search warrant when a suspect claimed to have fired on someone breaking into his house. Although the police, although the police asserted they identified themselves as police, the prosecution was unable to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the resident was not acting in self-defense. So somebody broke in the man's house, and he just his natural instincts was, "Hey, you trying to protect your family? Not to protect your family. We we don't know who you are breaking in these houses, get coming in these houses like that, and people, you know, you get nervous, you get scared, because the only thing you can think about is." I got to protect my family. So those uh, knock and announce, the knock and announce rule, and that's related to the, uh, I, guess, I think they call it the no knock warrant, but it looks like they knock, look like they knock one, they knock one time and announce themselves. And I believe that's all they do. One time announce themselves. But, you know, you can read up into this stuff, you know, read, read for yourself sometimes. I'm just reading over this. But you can also read, you know, you go to, go to YouTube, you go to the internet, go to Google. And, uh, Google is a multi-billion dollar company. So, their, uh, information, information is, is, uh, authentic, I would say. Uh, yeah, you got, uh. Deadly force, citizens arrest, excuse me, use of deadly force is restricted to cases of self-defense or public safety. In the past, this was not the case. It not the case, the fleeing felon, the, the fleeing felon rule allowed police officers to shoot to kill any felon who fled to escape arrest. This is no longer true. In Tennessee versus Gardner, 1985, the court ruled that law enforcement officers, officers cannot shoot fleeing felons unless they present an imminent danger to life. So the rule has changed on that. It said this is no longer true. Uh, in Tennessee versus Garner, 1985, the court ruled that law enforcement officers cannot shoot fleeing felons unless they present an imminent danger to life. So if somebody commit a crime, Somebody commit a crime and they're running away. They had to be a felon. So I mean, you know, if you if you if you committed a misdemeanor crime and you running away, so according to the book, it said fleeing felon. So it says, uh, um, I said the fleeing felon. The fleeing felon rule allowed police officers to shoot to kill any felon who fled to escape arrest. This is no longer true. The court ruled that law enforcement officers uh, cannot shoot fleeing felons unless they present an imminent danger to life. So they can be fleeing from the police officer and the police can still uh, protect themselves if they feel their life is in danger. They can be fleeing away from the officer, but if the officer thinks that his life uh, is in danger, so that's how they go. And then you can make a citizen's arrest. I think I just went over that. Uh, that's the end of that. Uh, So we have a um, scope of searches, scope of searches, searches with a warrant. Uh, the framers of the Constitution, no doubt, chose those words very carefully to prohibit the general searches they found 
so abhor abhorrent under British rule, although they recognized that government would have a legitimate interest uh, in enforcing law, including executing searches, they limited the scope of any search to only what was necessary, thus balancing the needs of society with those of the individual. In other words, they, uh, the officers go to the magistrate, go to the judge, and if they have knowledge of a crime being committed, they might ask the magistrate to issue a search, or uh, issue them a search warrant, but the search warrant has to specify uh, the area to be searched, person to be searched, I guess the person to be searched, the person to be seized, area to be searched, and so basically the search warrant is, is, is specific to what is going to be honored in that search warrant. They can't just uh, come to you, come to a person's house and then search the whole house and if that's not specified in the search warrant. So it said after officers have obtained their search warrant and gained interest, they can search only areas where it is reasonable to believe the specified items might be found. It says searches conducted with a search warrant must be limited to the specific area and specific items described in the warrant. So if the warrant if the warrant states only one specific item is being sought. Once it is located, the search must end. So it's good to read up on this stuff. I like to, I like to keep my mind. You know, I, I'm always willing to learn. I love to read this type of stuff. You know, I love to read. I used to come home from college, and all I did was, I didn't mind opening my book. Yep, searches without a warrant. I did. I think I didn't. No, I didn't read this yet. Searches without a warrant. The Fourth Amendment prefers a warrant because it necessitates judicial review of government action. Thus, the presumption exists that a warrantless search is unreasonable, thus unlawful, and therefore invoking an exclusionary rule with the resulting evidence not permitted in court. Searches with consent. So if an individual gives voluntary consent for the police to search his or her person or property, the police may do so without a warrant. And any evidence found would be admissible in court. So if they ask you, they say, hey, if you got an ass, then I must have the right to say no. You know, so I'll, you know, right to my privacy, my Fourth Amendment rights. Okay, I think that is, I went over this stuff yesterday, but I can go back over this. We have the frisk, stop and frisk, and we have the plain feel and the plain touch. Okay, the elements of stop and frisk laws were discussed earlier, so I read over that earlier, but stop and frisk. When an officer is justified in believing that the individual whose suspicious behavior he is, he is investigating at close range is armed and presently dangerous, the officer or to, to the officer or to others, it would appear to be clearly unreasonable to deny the officer the power to take necessary measures to determine whether the person is in fact carrying a weapon and to neutralize the threat of physical harm. Terry versus Ohio. So uh, you can read one in case too. Terry versus Ohio, 1968. Factors contributing to the decision to frisk someone might include a suspect who flees, a bulge in the suspect's clothing, a suspect's hand concealed in a pocket, being in a known high crime area, and when the suspected crime would likely involve a weapon. Whether the frisk is lawful is based on the totality of the circumstances, usually not one factor alone. If a frisk is authorized by the circumstances of an investigative stop, only a limited pat down of the detainee's outer clothing for the safety of the officer is authorized. So if a frisk is authorized by the circumstances of an investigative stop, only a limited pat down of the detain detainee's outer clothing for the safety of the officer is authorized. We had a plain feel, plain touch, uh, plain feel, plain touch. Uh, item felt during a lawful stop and frisk may be retrieved if the officer immediately recognizes them as contraband. So they touching and feeling around in your pocket, but they can't, you know, the officer touching and feeling around in your, in your pocket and they saying they're thinking that it's, 
maybe some some drugs or something, but they can't see it. They feel it around in your pocket. It says, um, the court ruled in 1993 that police do not need a warrant to seize narcotics detected while frisking a suspect for concealed weapons as long as the narcotics are instantly, instantly recognized by plain feel or plain touch. So they're searching you for weapons, but they're looking in your pocket, searching in your pocket. And see if you have, uh, if you have any, uh, narcotics in your pocket. Oh, so I went over that plain view evidence. The court recognized that it would be unreasonable to expect police officers to either ignore or to delay acting on something illegal that they see. So if they see something like I, like I read previously, if they see someone committing a crime, uh, see someone committing a crime, then, uh, you know, that's, that's in plain view. That's plain view. Uh, plain view, unconcealed evidence that officers see while engaged in lawful activity and may, it may be seized. Uh, okay, let me see. Let's talk about one last thing in this book right here. This, uh, the rights of the, by, the rights, other rights guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment is unique. And then it covers such an array of legal areas applying to both criminal and civil law. This reflects the framers of the Constitution, the awareness of the power government has over all aspects of people's lives and how their power needs to be regulated. The Fifth Amendment contains a number of seemingly unrelated elements, some pertaining more to criminal law, uh, some apply to only the gov or federal government, while others apply to the states as well. Although this text addresses law as it pertains to criminal uh, justice, to fully appreciate this amendment, it needs to be considered in total. So we're talking about the Fifth Amendment. So the Fifth Amendment is a right to grand jury, right to double jeopardy, so it can't, you can't be tried uh, twice for the same crime. Uh, the Fifth Amendment states no person shall be held to answer for capital or otherwise infamous crime or less on a less on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Uh, the double jeopardy clause has been incorporated into the, the 14th Amendment, but double jeopardy is still in the Fifth, fifth Amendment too. So you can't be tried twice for the same crime. Uh, the Fifth Amendment and the corrections so I'm not going to read, really get into all this right now. I might come back with this on my next video. So the Fifth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment does not arise often in prisoners' rights cases, but it may apply to inmates being questioned about offenses separate from those they are serving time for, or those inmates involved in internal disciplinary proceedings. Right. So the Fifth Amendment. So they have to have some kind of rights. The court decided that Miranda did not apply because. There was no custodial interrogation uh, that would necessitate reading the warnings. The Fifth Amendment corrections. Okay, I think that's it for that book. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think that was it. Let's see, I'm at an hour. I think I'm going to stop. Let me see what I have over here. Uh, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about consumer law. Let's read a little bit right here. The distinct, the distinct trend away... From the Covid emptor, let the buyer beware. Philosophy can be observed in judicial decisions, statutes, and regulations issued by administrative or, or agencies. <laughs> the focus of this chapter is upon is upon protection afforded to consumers engaging in sales and financing. So, consumer law. 
So, consumer laws are there to protect, uh, consumer laws to protect us as the consumers. You buy a product, um, like I said, um, product liability, strict liability. You buy a product, you buy something and it, and it, and it, and it, and it, uh, it, it, um, it, it hurts you, it damages you. Uh, product liability. So, we are protected. We are protected. Uh, manufacturer, the manufacturer and the seller will be liable to, for your damages. Uh, okay, let's see what else I have. Okay, we have antitrust law. Uh, <laughs> In the United States, strong public policies that are predicted or predicated upon the precise, I mean, the premise that economic concentration is harmful, favor the maintenance of business competition. Uh, for this reason, restraints of trade and other unfair methods of competition have long been discouraged and, in some cases, prohibited by judicial decisions and statutes. Statutes are your laws. The Sherman Act of 1890 was the first major federal legislation adopted in order to deal with anti-competitive practices. It was allowed, it was followed by the Clayton Act in 1914. Both statutes have since been amended. Market power and antitrust laws. So this is just some questions that they that they have. I'm not going to go into those questions. Let's see. We have checks in the bank. We have checks in the banking system. The most the most frequently used form of commercial paper is a check. A demand draft which is drawn on a financial institution. The provisions of Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code, as I said, the UCC, they govern business transactions, the Uniform Commercial Code, many of which have been Discussed in the preceding chapters, uh, checks in the banking system. I think that's it for that book. Uh, that's it. Every time I get ready to start reading, and let me see what I have in this book. Say, okay, mm, okay, I got a few more minutes. Let's talk about um. We have tort law. A tort is a private wrong that injures another person's physical well-being, property, or reputation. Uh, a person who commits a tort and has engaged in this twisted behavior is called a tort feeser. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into too much. I think I'm going to wrap this video up here because I already... I think I already talked about some of these things, but there's so, many, there's so much, you know, in this book right here. Well, here we're word right here. I don't think I mentioned yesterday. We have, um, when, uh, it's called undue influence. Uh, when, a, when the obviously dominant party in a confidential relationship uses excessive pressure to convince the weaker party to enter a contract that greatly benefits the dominant party, it's called undue influence. Somebody try to um, dominate you and use excessive pressure to convince you to enter into a contract, and um, that's called undue influence. To prove undue influence, it must be shown that a confidential relationship existed between the parties. A confidential relationship involves trust and independence between the two parties. So I think I'm going to stop. What else I have over here? Uh, I'll read some of this stuff the next time. But some of these different acts I like to get into next time. We had a Clayton Act, exempted exempted union activity from the antitrust laws. We had a Railway Labor Act, provided for supervision of collective bargaining. For railroads and airlines. We had the Norris LaGuardia Act, outlawed yellow dog contracts, limited the power of federal courts to issue injunctions to halt labor disputes, guaranteed employees the right to organize into unions and to engage in collective bargaining. 
So that's good. They made it possible so uh, they have, you know, uh, collective bargaining, organized unit, unions, employees, they get employees right to organize unions, engage in collective bargaining, uh, issue injunctions to halt labor disputes. We got something called the Wag Wagner Act, created the National Labor Regula Regulations Board, authorized NLRB to conduct a representative election and to determine the bargaining unit, outlaw certain conduct by employers as unfair labor practices. The Tab Hartley Act, I remember that name, Tab Hartley Act outlines certain practices based Certain practices by unions and unfair labor practices allow states to, le to legislate right to work laws, provide an 80 day cooling off period in strikes that endanger national health or safety, create a mediation and conciliation service to assist in the settlement of labor disputes. Landrum Griffin Act established a Bill of Rights for union members, required unions to adopt constitutions and bylaws. Require unions to submit annual reports uh, detailing assets, liabilities, payments, and loans, added further provisions to the list of unfair labor practices. <laughs> so I think I'm going to stop right there. Uh, uh, I am in an hour, and I want to say thanks for joining me today. And Mm, these are so good. I usually drink. Mm, I usually drink like two a day. I drink like two a day, but um, I want to say thanks for joining me. Glad you could be here. Glad to see you. Mm -hmm. Glad you can join me. So, uh, comment below, subscribe below. So I'm just reading off, you know, just reading some um. Valuable information out of my, my, you know, my, my books that I, I use when I was down Australia University, in Washington, D.C. So just trying to give you some valuable information. So comment below, subscribe below, and let me know if, you know, there are any other subjects that you want to, um, any other subjects that you want me to, um, any other topics, I guess, that you want me to talk about. And, also, I definitely want to learn how to play this uh, guitar. Mm -hmm. I want to learn how to play this guitar while I need to so I can go, you know, go on YouTube. I want to go on YouTube, man. <laughs> I, I had been working on my chords some time ago, but I fell back, so, but uh, I fell back off my, uh, you know, my learning, but I'm going to get back on it. Thanks for joining me today, and uh, glad to see you, glad you can join me, glad you can be here, and um, you know, comment below, subscribe below, and um, comment below, subscribe below, comment below, subscribe below, and you know, I'll see you 
on my next video. And I like to blow my balloons up all the time. So, you know, I'll definitely see you on the next video. And, you know, you all have a good one. So, So, you know, you all have a good one. Comment below, subscribe below, and I hope that, you know, comment below. Tell me, do you have any ideas that, um, you have any, you know, anything you might want me to talk about? You might want me to do some research? I don't mind, you know, don't mind, because we're all here to learn. I want to learn. I want you to learn. I'm learning, and I can just, you know, Showing you a few things that I know, and hopefully, if you have anything, you know, that you want me to learn, comment below, subscribe below, and I'll see you on my next video. I'll definitely see you on my next video. So I take um, I also take donations, Venmo. I'll put all the information below. Subscribe below, comment below, and um, I'll see you on my next video. And you all have a good one. You all take care. You all have a good one.